Hello, I hope everyone uh, can hear me and uh, welcome to our final session for the Potato Showcase Week. Um, I'm Claire Hodge and I work for AHDB and my role is based up in Scotland, uh, working with arable crops uh, and uh, I'm looking after the, the, the final session, looking at what's happening in the, the strategic farms across the country. Um, I always really enjoy this time of year and it's a time to get out to the field and look at what's happening, see what demonstrations we've got on and look at what conversations are important. Uh, unfortunately, we can't all be here in person, but um, we've got a brilliant session ahead of us to look at what's going on around the country and in the fields. So uh, I will start us with our uh, slides. So I'll do some housekeeping to start with. Um, if you're uh, watching, please keep your microphones off. Uh, if you want to ask questions, just use the box on the right-hand side and you can just type those in and we'll, we'll come to them at the end. We plan to finish at five o'clock. Uh, there's basis and the rosa points available, uh, one for each. Just put your, put your details into the corner and we will make sure that's uh, counted. And also the session is being recorded, so you'll be able to follow this up later on uh, as you go through the week. Uh, and you can follow us on Twitter. So the programme is uh, a brief introduction for me because there's so much else to listen to and learn from. Uh, then we've got Mike Shapland from the East, Will Gag from the North, uh, Jim Reid from Scotland, and then we're going to get a technical update from Eric Anderson from Scottish Agronomy. So uh, absolutely loads to do, uh, to see. Um, so I will keep things moving quite quickly, but do keep the questions coming in and we will deal with all of them. And even if we can't deal with them in this session, uh, we will follow up with everybody. Um, if, uh, if you're interested in what we've been up to this week, I, I think it has been so much information. It's been absolutely brilliant, but an awful lot to take in. I've been watching them all and uh, some of them have just uh, fully packed with information on Monday, we looked at market outlook, you know, hard times at the moment, uh, bearing in mind what's happening with COVID and then thinking about different uh, planting areas which have just come out last week. So um, a really interesting seminar on Monday which you can catch up on. Tuesday we looked at research, um, some fantastic research going on in black leg, aphids and virus, um, brilliant catch up there. Uh, Precision yesterday we had a bit of a, 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 a a fight off with the different uh, companies to see which ones, who's delivering what, what's going on, how do farmers actually use this. I would recommend uh, catching up on that one, uh, which uh, which matches your business best. And then today, as I say, we've got the, the spot farm and uh, my favourite part of, the, of what we do at HDB. So just a brief outline of what we, we do with the spot farms. Um, there is loads going on uh, and, and as normally throughout the year, we'd be able to catch up with field walks and open days and, and loads of really nice gatherings. But unfortunately, uh, this year we can't do that. But there's so much happening within these uh, within the, the programme. We will just touch on what's happening. But we, you know, we, we're covering desiccation, like hydrazine, uh, looking at sampling with PCN, herbicides, cultivation, aphid management, irrigation and precision farming. So loads going on there and we, unfortunately we've only got time to cover uh, uh, small parts of that today but we will make sure that all the information that is, is happening, uh, coming out of the spot farms will be updated as we go throughout the year. So I'm just going to start off just to check that we've actually got people here and listening to, to what we're doing. Uh, we've got our first question uh, to ask everybody, what demonstrations are people most interested in, in their, for their own businesses? So this is looking good for us today. <laughs> it's, uh, pest and disease is coming out strongly. You're, you're at the right session. <laughs> but I'm going to hand over to Mike to start with um, uh, and, and just ask Mike what his experiences so far have been uh, and where he's finding his kind of biggest learnings from the programme so far. Thank you, Claire. Can you hear me, everyone? Yep, I think that's coming through. Okay, good. Okay, well, 
yeah, we've had a fairly challenging season so far. Um, and obviously coronavirus has um, been disappointing the fact that it's meant that we haven't been able to bring people on to, to see what we're doing at Spot East. But um, we've obviously pushed ahead with, you know, quite a comprehensive um, programme of trials and demonstration plots in any case. Um, from my point of view, obviously, the, um, the water situation and the dryness and the heat of the season has probably been our biggest challenge to date, to be honest. Um, we've had um, we, we've had extremely dry conditions since um, shortly after planting, really. And we're now in a situation where we're actually running out of water on several of our farms, which is um, shades of 2018. Um, again, to be honest, so we're getting some rain at the moment, same as other parts of the country, but um, long term, that's probably been one of the biggest challenges for us. Um, specifically in terms of some of the areas that we're looking at, then um, the, the herbicide work has been quite interesting. Um, and I think like a lot of growers, we've had to adopt a two spray strategy um, in terms of trying to manage without diquat now as a total herbicide. Um, and I think the other bits of learning for us that have come out have been um, how to try and use the, the PPO inhibitors um, and try to minimise any knocks on, on crop development, really. Um, you know, if we're not careful and we're seeing where we're applying those PPO inhibitors a little bit too late, then potentially we're retarding crops two or three weeks, which is obviously giving us a knock-on effect. Um, in terms of um, other points, really, um, aphid numbers, um, in traps have been extremely high and we've had some very high indices um, coming back. So um, I think um, it's going to be an extremely challenging year from a virus point of view. Um, and yeah, we will <coughs> we'll see how that progresses. And no doubt Eric will say quite a bit more on that subject as we go forward through the seminar. Um, in terms of a sort of a, a bit of an update on the farm and what's happening in potatoes here, um, obviously, we're quite an early part of the world, so we're we're quite quite well on through lifting. Um, we've lifted quite a lot of fleece pier and open ground Maris pier now. We've cleared quite a bit of charlotte. We've lifted quite a lot of organic um, salad crops, and we've been lifting um, fleece piper crops as well, Maris piper for a while. So um, we're quite quite well through into the into the start of lifting. Tuber numbers on our early salad crops have been quite reasonable, to be honest. Um, some of the later ones mid-season when perhaps temperatures are a bit higher a little bit more disappointing um, but quality on the early salads has been okay um, quality on the early piper has been okay as well quite high tuber numbers perhaps not the size there and the marfona crops and early baker crops look to be reasonably high number as well um, and perhaps not the baker percentage there we've got a few challenges coming up with common scab where we haven't been able to keep up the water perhaps to the extent that we've uh, like so yeah it's going to be a challenge to see how we manage those crops but um yeah, it's quite a mixed bag overall but you know it's nice to nice to get lifting and, and get some harvest under our belts um looking forward i think the bits i'm really looking forward to seeing some results from this year will be um some of the work that we've done on viruses um, and virus control and, and aphid management and also um looking at the at the desiccation trial we've got so yeah, look forward to keeping you posted and keeping you updated in the future. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Mike. And we will get an, an opportunity to have a, a conversation with all the all the farmers at the end. Um, but uh, it's great to hear what's happening on site, even though we can't be there. So thank you. Thank you. So uh, now I'll ask Will to do the same. Just uh, these are very hot off the press photos because I think they came from the field this morning. Um, if Will can join us and just uh, as well give us a, a bit of an idea of what's happening again in the field, um, you know, looking forward and also, you know, kind of the dynamics of, of, of what that crop is destined for and what's going on. I don't know if Will is there. Yes, well, I'll hand over to you. Um, um, well, hope you can all hear me. Um, yeah, um, so far, I think we're proving that 2020 is just the year that just keeps giving. Um, in the form of uh, we had an incredibly cold uh, start um, around here. We were um, able to we were able to plant, but we, we held off for a long while just doing something for temperature. Um, but then when we got going, everything went fine. Uh, we went from one extreme though, a cold and relatively wet 
to extremely, extremely dry, um, um, with five to six weeks of um, well, flat out irrigating just as crops were emerging um, for scab control. Um, and yeah, a very, very busy period there where we've used a hell of a lot of water. Um, now we seem to be turning the other way, where um, just this month so far, we're on 47 mil. So in the first nine days, in the last nine days anyway. So um, yeah, we're turning relatively wet now. Um, a bit like a lot of other people, we've had to take a bit of a two spray strategy with um, emergence. So um, that's been without its challenges. And um, in some areas, we have checked crops back a little bit. Um, probably not come back 10 days at times. Um, yeah, and it could be variations within the field at the same time. Um, we've had incredibly high aphid numbers um, all over, basically, whether it's down on the silt land or even up on the wold. Uh, it seems a bit irrespective of where we've been. We seem to have very high aphid numbers. Um, so yeah, um, in general, though, the actual physical crop itself, um, I'd say skin finish wise, is looking basically second to none at the moment. Um, we, yeah, skin finish is just, yeah, absolutely perfect really at the moment. Um, but my only concern with what we have crop wise is uh, numbers. Now we seem to have very variable numbers depending on soil type. Um, on our silt land, um, we seem to have good numbers, but on our wold land, um, we seem to have seem to have slightly lower numbers. Now, whether that's down to cold earlier on or um, just what it is, um, still just sort of seem to be investigating. Um, but it seems irrespective of variety, really. Um, so yeah, that, that's uh, that's basically the crop. The crop, what we're we're actually looking at on the screen there is um, uh, a crop of pipe where we've got the irrigation trial, um, where we're actually seeing uh, drip irrigation, boom irrigation, and gun irrigation across the field. Um, we have, uh, I'll be honest, perfect, perfect skin finish uh, all the way across, but yeah, slight varying of numbers depending on the irrigation treatment. Um, so we're waiting to see what those results bring us. Um, so I'm quite looking forward to being able to see those results. Um, and also the results of the desiccation, um, which we're trialling further across in the field, um, where we've also played around with nutrition to see if we can help get nutrition um, to play some of the part um, of our desiccation as well. So yeah, that's basically roughly where we are. Um, I'm just going to ask you a little bit more. Um, so you've been doing this for a little bit longer than the others. Um, yep. What would be like so far, what's your experience been and kind of where do you want to, where, where are you taking it and how is it impacting? The rest of the business with what you're learning from some of the demonstrations like what would be your take-home highlights so far and what do you want to finish with um i'll be honest we've we've taken home quite a bit so far of um certainly on our nutrition um of cutting back nitrogen rates um certainly being on the forefront of desiccation um and uh yeah certainly with the, the help there both the ahdb and um, different scientists have actually helped us with. Um, also, being able to actually see on our own soil profiles of where nutrition and also herbicide controls um, are actually being. With that, we've actually been able to put that widely, a slightly bit wider across the business. And um, quite bluntly, it's saved us a hell of a lot of money. That's what we like to hear. <laughs> Very no Thank you very much, Will. Thank you. And then I'll move up to Scotland and I'll ask Jim to join us and give a bit of an update of what's happening on the seed side. Hey everyone, we are just uh, finishing the first inspections now. We've got the last four crops tomorrow. No real issues, uh, a small uh, bit of uh, virus and some new stocks, but uh, quite manageable. Our desiccation trials that we've uh, ran on our own uh, for the, this is the 10th season now, 
is actually showing up a, a bit of an anomaly as far as the uh, virus is concerned, which Eric will expand on uh, later on. But it was it was a bit of a shock. I haven't seen uh, leaf roll for about 15 years. Uh, but obviously, we're everything that we do are McCain potatoes. Uh, their seed uh, depot is only six miles away from us. So we've been with McCain since 1986, uh, with Colin Heron and his team down there. Uh, the, this is the first year that we've actually trapped aphids. We've, I've been lazy and I've always relied on Rob's traps, which have been next door. Uh, and we've got three traps in uh, areas of uh, uh, crop, uh, green crop, that uh, I, I'm amazed at the variation. There's only 100 metres between each trap, but it's quite clear that the trap that's on the prevailing wind for us this year has actually been north and northeast. And the trap C, its the index is a, a fair bit higher. And such a small distance, it's quite... Uh, it's quite a, a, a difference. The, the trial number, the treatment five that we've had this uh, leaf roll in, uh, was one that had a reduced water volume. So, you know, when it comes to desiccation or for any application, to be honest, uh, you know, a nozzle choice, water volume uh, is definitely important. I think that too many, too many uh, folk try and do it with 200 litres, and it's just not enough for. Uh, the size of crops that we're, we're handling. We've got a fertilizer trial where we're comparing uh, muriate of potash and uh, sulfate of potash that we can already see a difference in the in the color of the trial. So that will be interesting to follow through. Uh, with cultivation methods, uh, methods this year were quite different. Uh, we had a 30 acre field, we've had the driest spring on record. Uh, and I was scared to death. <laughs> it was too wet to plough in the winter time, and then it was too dry. So we actually mint tilled it and went straight in with the bed tiller and then the destoners. So it looks a reasonable job. Hindsight's a great thing. I wish we'd spray the field first. There's one or two bits of meadow grass, but I'm fairly confident they're all uh, where the destoner put them. So I don't think it'll affect the crop at all. Uh, so just looking forward to the season. Uh, Jim, I suppose I've got a little bit of a question to ask there. Is that you've been doing these kind of demonstrations for a long time, um, but you have a real aptitude of kind of working out how to make it work on farm uh, and look for that technical information, but also find those practical solutions. So I don't know if you can maybe like summarize your drive yeah, to, you know, like what you're seeing on farm and, and, and with all the experience you've got, how 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 others can kind of learn from what you're doing and, and where you see the project going to? I think that the main thing is we are doing it very much with farm machinery. So we're using one section of the sprayer boom uh, and treating, isolating three beds with each treatment and retaining a ton out of the middle of each treatment and replanting that the following year. This all started when we did the desiccation trials for Syngenta in 2011, and we planted the progeny seeds, and the variation in black leg levels, the only thing that was different in the field was the desiccation methods, and that's what started us down the road. And Eric supported us uh, and Syngenta all the way through, and the variation in black leg levels, uh, you know, it's unbelievable, uh, the difference. The, and we've showed up one or two other things is not only black leg uh, differences. So it's really interesting. We often end up asking more questions than we get answers, but uh, this is the 10th season that we've done it. But obviously, with it losing Dicot last year, we've looked at different things. Uh, and it's definitely going to be a challenge. There's no question about that. Yeah, well, I mean, we've got... Uh so much going on in the field it's really it's really delightful to actually kind of try and tackle some of those challenges head on mm -hmm. so thank you very much for doing all the hard work <laughs> um right. uh, we will now move on to uh we're gonna uh, move on hand over to eric anderson from scotch agronomy uh, he's going to give us a, an overview of what's happening on the, the scottish program uh, looking at um sustainable pcn management uh, alternative practices to pest management and uh, 
to sustainably manage virus and a, a, a sneak preview of the desiccation and, and unintended consequences. The, the picture there that you see uh, behind that is the, the Spot Scotland seed field. Um, so you can see, uh, well, Eric will talk about everything that's going on there. But uh, as I say, it's the, the best thing about this programme is there's there's so much to go at. Uh, so there's, there's loads going on in here. We've got a uh, trap crops, the wildflowers uh, down the middle, um, just so much and so exciting. So we'll make sure everybody is updated as we go. We'll have a live cam camera in there as well. So and we're flying weekly across so that there'll be loads of updates and loads of information for people to follow. And I hope you do uh, keep following us to see what's happening. But I'll hand over to Eric Anderson from Scottish Agronomy, who will talk us through the, the technical detail and, and uh, some of the the nice pieces of information that we're already getting out of this project. I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Eric. Okay, thank you, Claire. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm the senior agronomist for Scotch Agronomy and very proud to be part of HDB's Spot Farm programme with Jim Reed, McCain Potatoes, um, and the whole team, really, including Claire, over the next four years. My aim and objective really is to stimulate debate and, and, and discussion so that you as growers get something out of this and, and get some real practical messages. First slide, Claire. Okay, so we're going to lead off by having a discussion for the next 20 minutes or so on uh, PCN. I believe very strongly that we need joint ownership of the, the PCN problem. Pro um, and there is a need for both the where, the, the processing and the seed sectors to have joint ownership of this. From a, a grower's perspective, any actions that are achieved need to be uh, practicable and we need to recognise that resistant varieties may well be 10 years away uh, before many uh, resistant varieties to Globodera pallida in particular are uh, widespread for the, the weir sector. They're pretty uh, commonplace in the processing sector just now, but not quite so common in the weir sector. We need to invest in strategic research and we need to look at sustainable IPM programmes. Just as a bit of a background, the dominant species has changed from Globodera ristochiensis to Globodera pallida, and pallida is far more challenging to, to manage. In the 1970s in Scotland, SASA's findings of pallida represented only 2 to 3% of all PCN findings, whereas now they account for over 65%. <clears throat> now, some of you may be familiar with the fact that PCN has been regulated for over 50 years and it's not going away as a problem. It is a European plant protection organism. Uh, that's an EPO uh, A2 pest. And there is a requirement of the seed potato classification scheme that all crops entered for inspection must be grown on land, which is a clearance certificate in force at the time of planting issued by SASA. Some people's interpretation of a clearance certificate is different to another. Basically, a clearance certificate is given if they don't find PCN in that test. It doesn't necessarily mean that there is no PCN present in the field. It's just below the detectable levels uh, for that particular test and the sample that's taken. And there is, I feel, a general lack of consequences for poor PCN management, particularly in relation to rented land. And indeed for seed, a lot of land is rented. And for many, biosecurity considerations are often a low priority. There's no compunction for weir growers to practice uh, rotations between potato crops. And this can be a particular problem in rented land where growers may not always be aware of what's going on within the previous rotation. Next slide, Claire. The industry continues to, to lose approved products. And this is becoming a, a strong challenge. Revocation dates we have at present in relation to nematicides are uh, Vidate for 31st of December 2020, Nemethorin 30th of April 2023, and Vellum Prime 31st of July 2026. Now, these dates can change and, and probably will continue to change, but there's no guarantee 
that we will have nematicides for the for the future. So we must start looking at alternative strategies. Next slide, Claire. In my parlance, a PCN control strategy contains a number of different methods of control that can be taken together and that can have a positive effect at reducing the population of PCN in a particular field or land block. So if we look at uh, what we've got in front of us here, we've all got the aim of prevention. So we're looking at, in a very basic sense, controlling potato volunteers. We're talking about awareness and knowledge transfer and we're looking at engaging with uh, land managers and, and landowners. We've got to have an inventory of what PCN is on the land and what species it is, and then we can look at solutions in terms of crop sequencing, uh, using uh, catch crops, nematicides, organic amendments, or indeed more basically as crop rotation. But there's lots of tools within the, the current toolbox. Next slide, please. The current situation in Scotland is that around 11,000 hectares are planted for the production of classified seed potatoes. Roughly 17,000 hectares are planted for weir production, and SASA currently tests 17,500 hectares per annum for, for PCN. Of that, about 5.3% or 800 hectares is recorded each year as infested. On a more limited survey of um, statutory testing where land indicates that about 33% of this land is infested with PCN, 26 with Globodera pallida, and that compares with other uh, laboratories which are also testing uh, where land in Scotland such as SRUC, where the most recent figures suggest that over 75% uh, of the land is uh, infested with some degree of Globodera pallida. So there's a, a clear challenge building. And we estimate that in each year, more than 5,000 hectares of Scotland's 28,000 hectares, uh, that's 20% of commercial potato production, is planted on land which has detectable populations of PCN present. So there's no denying that there is a, a strong challenge. And at the moment, PCN in statutory testing is being found in you know, it's, you know, between 500 and 800 hectares per year. But this exponential growth means that by 2025, there could be 1,400 to 1,500 hectares per annum being uh, affected by PCN. And with six year rotations within the seed sector, the management decisions that we're taking just now will only change things from 2026 onwards. So there is a strong legacy effect. Next slide, please, Claire. So we've got a poll here. Uh, Eric, I don't know. It, is controlling volunteers important to you in your business? So we'll get some answers from the audience. Well open, but we seem to be getting the right answer. So Eric, I don't know if you can see that. 98%. Yes, and 2% no. So yeah. okay, so that that is is good that people believe that volunteers are important. But in previous work that uh, we conducted for uh, HDB, we did find there was a long legacy effect of volunteers in fields uh, and land blocks being used for seed and that there was a uh, both a high virus content and there you know, clearly that's having effect on on PCN as well this next slide Claire you on to the next poll three okay Is glyphosate a tool for PCN control on your farm? Slightly more controversial on this, Eric. There's no right and wrong answers.
There we go. Closed 70% yes and 30% no. Okay. So the, the conundrum or the question to, uh, to ask Matt really is what happens if we were to lose glyphosate uh, use in cereal crops uh, as a pre-harvest tool and only to be allowed to use that in stubbles, which is uh, a possibility move, moving forward over the next few years. Let's move on with the presentation, Claire. Slide six. You got that? Not yet. No. Maybe we're still on the poll, I think. Poll's no longer on. What, what's the title of the slide, please, Eric? Uh, slide six, economic cost for Pallida. I can see that on mine. Can you see it on the screen? It's on mine, 19, oh. slide 19. I'll start running it through mine. <clears throat> can you see it? Can you see it now, Eric? I don't see that on screen. I can try past you the controls, Eric. See if we can run it through yours if you want to give that a go. Okay, I can see it now. Okay, perfect. We'll carry on then. Okay. So, um, in today's parlance, what we need to uh, consider is how we should flatten the, the curve. What we have here is data from uh, the Plant Health Scotland recently commissioned a piece of work from Adam Kalowski from Strathclyde University that uh, indicates that the cost of the industry is over two and a half million pounds per, uh, per annum. And if the industry continues to take no concerted action against PCN, the, whereby the status quo is maintained, estimates are that the, uh, the loss uh, of two to three million pounds per year in sea potatoes will build to five or six million pound loss by 2025. So we need to understand that the, we're on a, a track, we're on a route. There's probably nothing we can do over the next six years, but thereafter, we should be aiming to, to flatten, flatten the curve. Next slide. In terms of sustainable management of PCN, what this uh, graph shows is there's a big effect of rotation. A three year rotation in the blue line you can see there, uh, or a six year rotation in, in green. And the threshold for detection on a three year rotation is arrived at after 12 years. That's the orange line you can see horizontally. Uh, and on a six year rotation, it's closer to, to 30 years. The orange line represents a limit of detection for 1500 mil sample based on a population density of 3.8 million cysts per hectare based on one focus. And at this point, uh, this is the threshold for the statutory test is likely to come back uh, above the orange line and tell you you've got PCN. Below that orange line, it will tell you there is uh, uh, no PCN found. So it's important that people understand from the, uh, the results they get back how to interpret them correctly. So often a PCN infestation we see now in a test result is what has happened and a legacy effect over the last 30 to 40 years. Next slide. The decline of PCN within a field has two components. One is natural mortality from causes such as parasitism, and the second is from spontaneous hatch of a proportion of the eggs that hatch each year. The juveniles from those eggs will die if they fail to find a host. And the rate of decline in Globodera pallida in the UK is typically 20%, much slower than that of Globodera restockiensis at 30%. The rate of decline increases um, as the soil temperature rises and decline is fastest in sandy soils and slower in silt 
clay or organic soils. So there are there are differences. Next slide. The model data that I showed previous uh, assumes that there are no groundkeepers throughout the rotation, and groundkeepers at other points in the rotation will allow multiplication of PCN to happen faster, and also if there is a break in the national decline rate. Control of groundkeepers inland where the potato crop is grown is, we often find there are small potatoes that will fall through the web and get left behind. And these tubers can develop into potato plants year after year and become a reservoir for both uh, multiplying PCN and importantly for later discussions in terms of virus, as well as uh, also exacerbating likes of rhizoctonia uh, soil-borne rhizoctonia in, in the soil. Next slide. So what happens if you don't control groundkeepers in the field? This model here shows quickly that a PCN population multiplies if potatoes are planted every year. Now, obviously, we don't plant seed potatoes every year, but if we allow groundkeepers, uh, that's exactly the same scenario. Along the bottom, we have the years after introduction, and you can see that the population reaches a detectable threshold of 3.8 million cysts per hectare after around about three and a half years after introduction. And every year after, it raises uh, or increases exponentially. So because we often take action of um, against PCN, particularly against Globodera pallida, at the detection limit of one cyst per hectare, then realistically, the economic damage threshold could be uh, said to be at the, the limit of detection for whichever test you are using. Now, the SASA uh, 1500 mils per hectare test has a limit of detection of 3.8 million cysts per hectare. There are other tests I will show in a few minutes with much higher uh, sampling frequency and volume of soil, which are capable of detecting down to 0 0.75 million cysts per, per hectare. So that's five times lower than the current statutory limit. Next slide. Scottish agronomy, uh, as well as McCain Potatoes, are involved in a rural innovation support service project, and that's looking at integrated control methods, including looking at sustainable control of, of PCN. We've got different objectives within the project, but one of the main objectives is to evaluate a new high-intensity soil sampling service in seed potato land. We're also looking at trap cropping, a knowledge exchange program for, for land managers, and uh, evaluating the use and development of a chitinous compost product for biological, biological control of, of PCN. Next slide. The data here, if we focus in on the blue box on the bottom right-hand side, shows that the, the current statutory sampling rates so if we have a nine hectare field, uh, it may not be comprised of any more than three sample units for PCN testing under the current rules. So for example, a nine hectare you could have a, a four plus a three plus a two, or a three plus a three plus a three. But in principle, the restrictions that are placed by SASA at present mean that you cannot have a sampling unit smaller than a minimum of, of two hectares. So if any PCN is found on a saturated test, that whole two hectare block, three hectare block, or in the worst case scenario, if it's all sampled as one unit as nine hectares, would go down and uh, preclude the, the growing of seed, although you can grow weigher crops under a, a control order. Next slide. If uh, under statutory sampling, you're using 1500 mils per, per hectare, or SAS is using 1500 mils per hectare, there is a probability of detection of 3.8 million cyst threshold in a single focus of 92%. However, under the lower uh, sample frequency of 400 mils, there's only a 39% probability of detecting. So it depends on your land block size, and it also depends on whether there's uh, what your rotation has been and whether there's been any PCN found uh, in that block or not. Next slide. The recommendation put out by HDB just over a year ago in a very useful guide uh, in terms of PCN sampling recommended that for seed growers, 
if you were undertaking a non-statutory test, you should be looking to evaluate the soil on a minimum of 1,500 mils per hectare. If you're a weir grower and you're sampling and you don't know you have got PCN, then you certainly should be sampling at a minimum of 100 cores uh, and 1,500 mils per hectare. But if you're sampling uh, and you know that there is PCN there and um, you're looking at species identification, then probably as a weir grower, you can accept uh, a 200 gram minimum sample, but preferably a 400 gram sample. Next slide. In this case study, we're looking at the population density of 5 million eggs per, per hectare. This is eggs, not, uh, not cysts. Now, at 49 cores per hectare uh, and a sample being processed of 400 grams, the probability of detection is only 31%. If you increase the number of cores to 100 instead of uh, 49 or 50, then the and the weight of sample is still 400 grams, then the probability of detection only increases to 39%. But there are many soil samples that are processed by laboratories, which may only be 100 grams or 200 grams. And you can see there at 200 grams, there's only a 20% probability of, of detection. So in a non-statutory test basis, you need to be aware of what you're asking for and be prepared to pay the price in order to detect uh, the lowest level of, of PCN present within, within the field to allow pro proactive action to, to be taken. Next slide. This shows uh, a field in Scotland, um, in Angus. It's part of a 28.9 hectare field. And of that, there were three blocks where um, scheduled effectively. So those were four hectare blocks, but in each of those four hectare blocks, you can see I've highlighted in red, each of those uh, in red is a, a, a subdivision of 0 0.27 hectares. So it's relatively small parcels that were bringing down the whole four hectare block. But sadly, just now, uh, SASA bulk all the soil from that four hectares together and report it as one sample. They're not using GIS uh, databases to take the samples and not logging the soil sample to a specific, a specific uh, geo-referenced data point. Uh, if that was undertaken and the technology is there, then there is the possibility if this was looked at that we could end up uh, scheduling much, much smaller areas. So that's something we're actually in discussion with at, at present. Next slide, please. Myself and several others from HDB, including farmers, uh, undertook a study tour to Holland last year. And what we found is that they are undertaking non-statutory soil sampling in order to manage PCN, but a much higher volume than that in, in the UK. Typically, UK growers on a non-statutory basis would get 100 gram or 400 gram of soil tested in a commercial laboratory, whereas in Holland they're often using 8, 10 or even 13 litres of soil to detect the very lowest level of PCN within a field and therefore give them a much larger lead time to proactively manage the, the problem. So detecting PCN before a statutory test does means that the growers have options available to them and importantly the Dutch take these soil samples, large soil samples, immediately post growing the previous potato crop to give the highest probability of detecting uh, low levels of PCN. Next slide. This, show, this table here shows the probability of finding PCN in a sample. So on the right-hand column, you can see for a population that has got uh, 3.8 million, which is comprised of a single peak of uh, 100 and three subsidiary peaks of, 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 of 50 uh, cysts per, per hectare. So you can see there that the probability of detecting on 1500 mils is 92%. However, if we look on the left hand side, the second column, then at one single peak of 50, which is the equivalent of 0.75 cysts per hectare, we would need to take 10 litres of soil or 10,000 uh, millilitres, 10 litres of soil to give a greater than 90% probability of detecting that low level of PCN. 
and that's what we've embarked upon uh, within the, this study. The probability of finding PCN in a sample varies greatly depending on many factors, but assuming that central focus has a population density of 100 cis per kilogram um, and therefore contains the the one you know you know the the 1.5 million cysts, typically that will give rise to uh, 3.8 million cysts per 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 hectare. So, in the in the absence of a host, the probability of detecting cysts will not normally change over a six-year period, and there is an advantage for the grower sampling in the immediately uh, in the period following a potato crop if potato crops are grown. And if you sample at 10 litres per hectare, you can detect a very low population of 0.75 million cysts per hectare, a fifth of the limit of detection that a statutory test would, would uh, detect. Next slide. The sampling methodology that we are using is to take 11 meter strip wide, um, so 11 meters by 303 meters long, uh, and at each uh, sample interval of nine meters means that we get uh, 100 sample points per hectare and we get 10 liters of, of soil per hectare. Next slide. The 11 meter strip equates with uh, six uh, uh, beds of 1.83 meters, meaning it fits in well with either double or triple bed planters. We could look at a 24 meter strip, but that works out at, at 13 beds by 1.83 meters. So it's not as convenient uh, when uh, trying to fit this in with a, with a shield with a field. So providing we know what the AB line is that the potatoes are going to be planted in, then we can try and mimic that. The cost for undertaking uh, this sampling is uh, under 135 pounds per per hectare, and that will include uh, cis nematode counts, viability assessments, egg juveniles, uh, and identification to to genus level. Uh, through uh, P PCR. Next slide. The work that we've embarked upon on the, the spot farm is that last year's field uh, at Murphy, we've already sampled at high intensity 10 litres of, of soil per hectare, and we're just awaiting the results to come back any day now. So we can see that in the um, each block is uh, at a maximum of one hectare. If the 11 metre strip was to uh, be after, if we're going to have any more than uh, 11 meter strips and it was to push it over uh, one, one hectare, then we curtail the block uh, as it is. So that's where you can see there, I don't know if you can read it, but 0 0.88, 0 0.7, uh, uh, 0.84 hectares. Each of those blocks are less than one hectare in total. Next slide. The real benefits of high intensity soil sampling are that we can detect PCN infestations at an early stage, and then we've got the opportunity of many years before a statutory test of taking preemptive action using all the tools in the toolbox, whether that's biological control, growing trap crops, um, lengthening the rotation. There are many tools which are available to us, but it also enables us to con use control measures and to avoid formal scheduling of, of land parcels. It, furthermore, it allows the benchmarking of PCN control and it allows individual land parcels to look at the PI, the population initial and population final values during the, re the rotation and look at the decline rate to enable users to explore long-term impact of different management strategies. Next slide. Within the, the treatments we're evaluating, we are part of the risk group. We're looking at trap crops, including non-native so, non solanaceous uh, species. Uh, Morvan Anderson from uh, Hutchinson's is part of the group, and she conducted her uh, MSC thesis on trap crop species. And there are several uh, promising species which we are, we are looking at. Next slide. We can use biofumigation. In Scotland, we believe that using 
Uh, oil radish is better than using Indian mustard, but it's also important to look at the, the, the pH, which drives the chemical reaction in the right direction. If the pH is below 5.6, it will drive the chemical reaction towards nitriles and will not generate the correct isothiocyanate profiles that will give us control and reduction of, of PCN. Next slide. It's important that we understand that where nematicides are used, they are indeed, the correct terminology is nematostats. They are not true nematicides. You can see here in the untreated, we get a 17-fold multiplication of Globidera pallida from the PI, the population initial, to population final. In the best treatment, uh, we still get a multiplication factor of three from the initial population before potatoes are planted to uh, three times that at the end of the, the potato growing season, which, uh, yes, it is a reduction, but it does not provide us with a sustainable way forward unless we're also integrating both uh, partial or fully resistant varieties and lengthening the, the rotation. Next slide. We are investigating a biological control of, of PCN through the use of chitinous composts. Next slide. And in the past, we have evaluated the use of resistant varieties to Globidera pallida. So Maris Piper is uh, fully susceptible to pallida. Osprey is partially resistant. And then you've got uh, Royale, which is also partially resistant, but we, our findings are that it punches above its weight in terms of its, its rating. Arsenal, Eurostar, Innovator and Performer were evaluated and found that they dropped the population without an nematicide to under the level we started to form. Now at Loughness, Ness, we know that we've got uh, Linley, uh, a PA, which is a PA1, a, a PA3 in terms of Loughness, Ness, and Duddingston as a, as a PA1 population all mixed in the same field. So the, the highly virulent PA2, PA3 Loughness, it is molecularly distinct from most European populations, and it's actually uh, closer to uh, populations found in Peru, uh, PA1 populations. But what we do know is it is a very aggressive uh, form of, of pallida. And yet here, we were able to show a sustainable reduction of population without a nematicide by just growing a resistant variety such as Innovator. For other varieties, you can look at the HDB variety database and that will give you the, the scores for PA1, PA2, as well as for Rostockiensis. But there are many varieties now available uh, with good ratings for Pallida, Arsenal, Camel, uh, Eland, Eurostar, Innovator, Panther, Performer, Lenorma, and Rocket are all reasonably widely grown. But the, the concept here was that uh, using something like Arsenal Eurostar Performer uh, or Innovator, we could reduce the population. Next slide. Okay, so that's uh, a very rapid uh, canter through some information on PCN and hopefully that will open up the debate at least on PCN management and how we can look at undertaking that sustainably. Claire? Sorry I got lost in the system. <laughs> are you wanting to do the poll now? Yes. Yeah so are you using IPM approaches in your management system or your approach to management? We get votes. We are running tight on time, um, and there's lots of really good questions coming in. So, um, just for the interest of time, we, we will keep things moving. We might skip the next poll. Brilliant. Seventy percent there. So, um, but Eric, we'll just. Uh, I know there's so much information. It's brilliant, and and we should have had a whole session on PC, and you always could, couldn't you? But um, we'll we'll keep pushing on, and we'll get to the questions because there's lots coming in. Which is brilliant. I'll let you keep going. Okay. So. Next, next slide. So we we know that there is uh, resistance to pyrethroids in peach potato aphids, 
in willow carrot aphids, in grain aphids, where we've got a KDR mutation that confers a uh, in the grain aphids at least a 35-fold resistance shift to pyrethroids. And there is most recently evidence of pyrethroid resistance in bird cherry oat aphids in Ireland, which we strongly suspect is also present in the UK. So increasingly, we believe that spraying pyrethroids will have a negative effect on beneficials and it may not be doing what you've previously assumed it was doing in controlling your, your aphid species which are in the field. So we're really interested in looking at biological control using natural enemies of aphids for uh, predation, for parasitism, and also using pathogens as alternatives. But remember, there is a lag phase in biological control uh, methods, and natural enemies do take time to, to build up the, the numbers. At Murphy, we will be looking at alternative practices, and you perhaps saw strips through the field. Uh, Jim has established uh, three meter wide strips in between the tram lines, and we're looking here at uh, a combination of methods uh, such as habitat manipulation and modification of cultural practices, as well as target chemistry. And hopefully over the next four years, it will encourage confidence for growers to adopt an integrated pest management uh, approach more widely and to improve potivirus control whilst reducing insecticide use within an arable crop, crop system. Next slide. It's worth noting that in uh, Scotland's context, we've got uh, a very low or nil tolerance of virus in certified seed. So typically, where we're growing at S grade, point, the threshold uh, for growing crop inspections is 0.2%, and for uh, SE, it would be 0.5%. Next slide. When we're trying to desiccate the crop, uh, I will come back to uh, insecticides in a minute, but when we're trying to desiccate crop, we've got to look at the physical state of the crop. There is no blueprint, and it, the seed crop is distinctly different challenge to that of a processing crop. A processing crop in the left-hand side is uh, you know, largely senescing and maybe 50 cents senesced before we're desiccating it, whereas a high-grade seed crop, if you, particularly if it's an indeterminate variety, is in full flight, it's vigorous, and as you can see there, uh, that uh, fork is a full-sized uh, fork and the crop was at least 0.7 meters high. Next slide. We've got a limited if side armory to extend if side control beyond burn down. And in our desiccation programs, we probably need to have some Spotlight Plus in reserve in order to tackle regrowth. And we've found that through uh, the process of uh, flailing, that very often if we flail without any preceding chemicals, we can, particularly in vigorous varieties, we can uh, see more, more regrowth. Next slide. Last year um, on the uh, farm at Murphy, we had a crop of daisy, which we started to desiccate on the 6th of August. And you can see Jim here on the left-hand photograph, the, the crop was uh, well above his, his waist height. Next slide. Linking back to, to Jim's, Jim's earlier comments, uh, desiccation work, blight spraying and if side spraying, it's all about the principles of choosing your product, looking at the timing, looking at a nozzle choice and the skill of the operator. But in, in principle, more than 50% of the result is all about application, application, application. All the desiccant products were applied through commercial sprayers in the next series of trials we're going to discuss. The first application was made using a Guardian twin air nozzles at four bar, 400 litres of water and 5.4 kilometres per hour, with the second and third applications using Defy 3D angle nozzles at three bar, 300 litres and travelling at 6.4 kilometres per hour. So in desiccation, it's really important in these vigorous crops that we take the time to apply the water and we slow down to apply them properly. Next slide. All desiccation products um, that we're applying these strip treatments are applied through a commercial sprayer. Therefore, they're mimicking 
what's happening in reality, and we get the the true physics of um, sprays working e effectively, and we can evaluate that because if we apply in a fully replicated small plot, we don't see the spray acting in the same way as it's applied through a commercial sprayer. But there on the left hand side, you see uh, date after application, uh, 21 days, and you've got Reglon, Reglon followed by Spotlight Plus. Um, and that has done a good job, but we've no longer got uh, Reglon in our armory because it's been revoked. On the right hand side, you can see pelagonic acid at 17% applied in 200 litres of water, followed by Spotlight uh, Gozai, followed by Spotlight Plus, and it's a much slower. Uh, burn down of the home. Everything achieved uh, skin set at about the same time, but the home reduction or, or green area of home was reduced very much slower without, without dicot. And that's something that we've got to get used to. Next slide. We split everything into five mil splits, and you can see that uh, there was differences depending on the treatments as they were applied through commercial sprayers. And that's something that growers will need to get used to, and they will need to initiate burn down probably three to five days or three to seven days earlier than they have done previously with the likes of, of, of Diquat. And on the site, we will be using tuber zone uh, as a metric to, to measure tuber size distribution and as a need to, to burn down. Next slide. I, I've used the, the metaphor here uh, of a green telephone uh, really to indicate the hormonal cascade events that occur through a, a plant that is initiated via desiccants. The phytohormones control growth and senescence within all plants, and ethylene is regarded as a multifunctional phytohormone that regulates both growth and senescence, and it promotes uh, or inhibits growth and senescence processes depending on the concentration uh, and within the, within the leaf. But there's also linkages through to abscisic acid, uh, and also you know there is lots of other um, hormonal triggers that occurs within the plants that we're only starting to understand uh, at present. It's too simple to think about the damage you're doing to the leaf and how rapidly home uh, senescence occurs relates to skin set. That is not the case. So we need to perhaps re recalibrate. Next slide. We've got to get uh, used to, to using a flail perhaps on some farms. And our ambition on the spot farm is to be filming and getting information out to levy peers within the next two to three weeks. But clearly, uh, laid home in some crops is, is going to be a challenge and we need to be looking at um, managing that situation as best as we can from the operator's perspective. Next slide. A flow diagram here is looking at what I regard as being best practice as a aid memoir or a management guide to desiccation and to use all the tools in the toolbox, depending on whether you've got a vigorous uh, canopy or you've got a senescent canopy, whether you're going for chemical only or whether you're going for a flail plus chemical approach. Now, where you've got a slow burn down, it's important from a seed perspective that in England, depending on um, your, your crop, if it's not burned down within uh, 14 days of your second inspection, then they will be looking to take tuber samples and your certification will be based on the results of those tuber samples. In Scotland, uh, third inspections will only be carried out by SASA at their discretion, uh, or if there is more than 25% of the tolerance for black red, black leg uh, with it within that grade. Uh, but otherwise, there is after second inspection, there's no fault, fault follow up. So the situation is distinctly different in Scotland as it is in England. But um, where you have got a third inspection taking place or you've got um, a lot of uh, aphid activity and potential ingress of virus, it is important to consider the consequences of how rapidly 
your crop is being burnt down. Next slide. This is uh, data hot off the press from Jim earlier this week. In roguing the 10 different treatments we assessed last year, the amount of leaf roll and mosaic we found within the areas that were planted back, we planted back 0.17 hectares, ranged from 0.04% up to 1.15%. That's a huge difference. And in those uh, plot areas, it ranged from roguing out four plants to 122 plants. Uh, that's a massive difference in, in workload and also a massive difference in the, uh, the quality of the seed that will be generated. So the speed of burn down can have a huge effect on the ingress of, of, of virus. And you know, Trevor Woodford back in 94 indicated that virus transmission of um, virus by insects is a highly variable process because it involves the interaction between virus, vector and, and the plant. But what we're seeing here is that we can get late ingress of virus if you don't have a, a good uh, desiccation process and, and program going on. And my last slide, Claire, is trying to wrap up all of that together um, into some key recommendations. Going forward, there is no blueprint. Each crop, each field situation needs to be assessed differently and use the most appropriate treatment for that field, for that variety, for that soil type. Passive bulking will require T1 treatments to be applied three to seven days earlier than you have done previously with, with, with Reglon or with Diquat to maintain the target yield in the saleable size fraction. It is essential that we conduct both late blight and virus protection until we get complete cessation of all green material. And we've got to continue to develop non-mechanical desiccation methods to facilitate home destruction where soils are wet at the point of desiccation, because it's not always possible to go through with a flail. Claire, I think at that point I should end and uh, hand back for, for any questions. Sorry, I'm still on mute. Uh, thank you very much for that, Eric. Um, there's always so much information to go through, isn't there? And there's so much going on within our strategic farms. I think I'm going to um, move things around a little bit because uh, we've got Nicholas Saffer, the chair of AHDB, uh, to kind of conclude the potato showcase week um, to kind of summarise what we've been doing and what's going on at AHDB. But there's loads of questions coming in, like I, I said a few moments ago. So we will go back to the questions and we'll make sure that they're all answered. So if people hold on, um, we will get back to those and we will keep discussing. Uh, I think we briefly lost Claire's audio again there. Um, but if we can have Nicholas, if you're there, if you'd be able to join us to say a few words. I think Claire's audio sometimes cuts out for... Right, let's try that. I hope you can all hear me. Yeah, um, you fine. I mean, the last person I want to hear speak is, is me now, having having been through that presentation. I'm, I'm eager to wait and hear the questions. I think it was absolutely fascinating. Um, for anybody who wonders what the, uh, the new chair of HDB knows about uh, potatoes, um, probably before most of you ever thought about potatoes. I'm, I'm about the only potato grower in the country who lost money in 1975 and 1976. Um, so when you start talking about weather, I, I have lots of experience of weather. Um, what, I, what I do want to say is that I, I think it's absolutely fantastic. I think this week, the showcase week has been really good. I think uh, responding to um, COVID-19 and having it online has taught us all a lot of lessons. It'll be good to see you all. And, and to get onto onto farms and have a look at some of this work, um, but I think I think that what is quite clear is not just what Eric said, but listening to Mike, to Will, uh, to Jim, um, and, and then thinking about the, the work of the week. There's an enormous amount of work we've got ahead of us. Um, we're talking mainly about pests and diseases and desiccation. We're, we could have talked about soils. We did during the week. Um, we've got storage issues to talk about in terms of sprout suppressants, and then on top of all of that, we've got We've got market to talk about in terms of not just COVID-19 and the catering market, but
but also trade agreements that are going to, they're going to come up and and um, particularly sea potato exports, which are going to be so dependent on where we end up post Brexit. So lots and lots of stuff coming at us um, in terms of in terms of HDB. Uh, what I would say is that we are we are in the middle of a strategic review, which we will go public on for consultation within the next um, six eight weeks. Um, the aim is to to consolidate on some of the key programs that we've got going on. We have far too many programs, and we've got to consolidate on the programs that are of key importance. Um, I think you can see on potatoes just what those are. I have no doubt at all that um, that we will carry on doing the, the work that's been been going on and do it more effectively. And the other thing we're looking at the whole time is value, um, how we can actually improve our efficiency and how we can we can get closer to to you on farms to be able to share that work with you. So that's all I want to say at this stage. I'm I'm, I'm hoping to see and listen to to many of you um, when you have your comments. But I really want to just thank, um, particularly today, to thank uh, Jim, Mike, Will, Eric, um, Claire. Um, and I think that um, um, for everybody who's been involved in, in the whole program of putting this week together, thank you very much. And thank you all for listening. Um, I look forward to seeing you again soon in reality. Thank you very much, Nicholas. That's great. We do all look forward to meeting you as well. Um, I'm just going to uh, move on to the slides and take us to uh, just what's happening going forward. So uh, we've had a busy week this week, but this doesn't stop. There's loads of there's loads of uh, really good information, and as we know, that there'll be lots of field events, and it's a busy time of year as well for farmers. So we, you know, this is bite size as well, and it'll keep the information will keep coming out. So on the 13th of July, we have a, an HDB webinar, um, kind of more looking at the business aspects of, of what's happening right now with COVID, react, respond, recover, what things can we do as businesses? And um, then on the 15th of July, there's a mental health wellbeing, handling financial hardship. Um, and there's a whole series of this kind of activity that you can tap into. Um, people might be interested as well on the 21st of July, a, a new thing that we've never done before, but a potato sector open board meeting. So people can log into that and, and learn about what, what's going on at the, with the board uh, and kind of ask, ask questions as well. And, and then there's, there has been so much information today that we, we just can't stop. So desiccation webinars will be happening in August and September. So please join and, and keep watching back because the information is all there and keep asking questions. Um, now, there has been lots of questions, so I'll invite everybody, the whole panel, to uh, show themselves. Um, I'll just go to our questions page. Oh. Oh, I'll leave us on there. Uh, everyone's back. So I've got lots of questions for everybody, and I don't know where I'll start. Where I'll start? Um, oh, so there was. A, I'll probably have to answer this first question. It's probably for me. But uh, could there be an opportunity to meet on the farm in small groups later in the season? So we will be piloting this in August, um, but the hope is that we can get into fields, um, and we will absolutely as soon as we can when it's safe. But like I said, we're going to do lots of digital activity to make sure that we. Um, that, that we can get that information out there. So everything's being captured uh, and please do just get in touch with us all. Um, you know, the reason that we all do this, I think I'm maybe perhaps talking for the farmers, um, but the reason that we do this is because we enjoy talking about it. So um, do do speak to us, even if it's through the, the knowledge exchange managers in your area, do uh, keep asking us questions because we, we like to talk about what's going on in the fields and the farms. Um, so I've got some questions. Um, let me see which ones we'll go back to. Um, on the back of last year's desiccation trials, what will the host farms use as their preferred method of desiccation, flail or spray? The, the usual question. So I'll ask the, the host farmers, Mike, well, uh, Jim, what you'll be doing this season. <laughs> Well, you know, you know what I think about flails in a seed crop? You know, I can understand where growers having a flail uh, because we don't quite understand uh, the, the difference in the change in the hormones. I know that the, 
crop definitely bulks when it's flailed green because it's always the biggest uh, crop when we harvest the desiccation trials. Uh, but there's always regrowth in it. It's slightly dependent on variety, but there's always, so that obviously is stimulating the plant to, to keep growing when it's flailed. Uh, and on our soil types, even in dry conditions, there's a noticeable difference in the clod formation at the sides where the flail's been working. So it definitely slows down the harvester. You need to have the harvester more aggressively set the, the separation system. So that's obviously something you want to be avoiding as well. So we'll be going down a chemical rate. We're personally going down a flail route at the moment through gritted teeth, quite frankly, would much rather go through a um, chemical route if we can. But at the moment, certainly for um, more vigorous and healthy crops, yeah, we can't see something what's actually going to kill um, takes properly um, on our soil types, unfortunately. So we are going down that flail route. But, yeah, um, like Jim was just saying, we're sort of investing more damage with sort of uh, um, compaction on the edge of the rows, cracking in the rows, potentially, um, and yeah, more issues along those lines. Um, so the sooner we can go away from that, we will be doing. If I can just add quickly, you know, if folk are going to go down the flail route, then I think it's important to shut the crop down first. It needs a T1 treatment. Yeah, so we're largely flail based um, and have been for a number of years, which is um, is more of an option than our very light soils. Um, but yeah, it's certainly going to present us with a challenge in some of our seed crops where my preference really is to go down a spray option and certainly to do a T1 spray first if we can do. Um, we, we do often use the opportunity actually while flailing to ridge roll as well, which does help on quite a few of our wet crops and our light soils in terms of reducing green, so we try to combine that. I would add to that, yeah, we're, we're going to be looking at um, ridge rolling as we go as well. Um, um, I'm not too concerned really about our, our walled soils, um, but our silts, yeah, that's, that's where my concern is coming from really at the moment. So it's a big issue, isn't it, for the industry? There's no kind of go-to. That's why we need to do these demonstrations, just to test out the kind of anomalies that we uh, get. Thank you for that. Um, another question I've got here is, uh, so I'll ask the strategic farmers first, and then I'll ask Eric kind of his views on this as well. Um, how do you test for virus, or do you, or how do you uh, test for virus in tubers? And what's your approach? Well, we uh, in our seed stocks, we send all of our stocks off for a full grown on test. Um, we have done for a number of years. Um, we've also used um, rapid testing in, earlier in the season to try and give us an indication, although we've had some discrepancy between the two results. So our, our baseline is looking at the full grown on test, which gives us a reasonable indication. And then we are, I suppose, over the years, we've We've verified that to an extent in terms of what we've seen in indoors crops um, and we're also obviously um, we're trapping aphids during the growing season as well to to give us information during the season we're doing something very similar to be honest uh, i think we only really extensively um uh, put it across the business uh two, sort of two years ago looking at um uh actually checking all our seed input stocks uh, for full growing on tests. Um, and it's actually surprising some of the results we're getting back. Um, and uh, yeah, you can really see a difference um, in, uh, in what, what you're basically, what, you, what you're planting really now. We have, you know, we are at a pretty high health uh, stage and I know McCain do if there are crops that have a, a level in them, uh, then they do have the, the tubers tested, but it's, it's not something we do with cell. But uh, having had the aphid traps this year, you know, I think it would be really good to, I think moving forward uh, for an IPM report uh, approach, that we've got to have these traps 
in every seed field. You know, just to find out where the concentrations are. We have a very low index of aphids, but there's still a variation of over five between the three traps, and there's only uh, 100 meters between them. Uh, so, you know, it's uh, it's you could actually base how healthy the crop is by what you've trapped. We've never had it. We heard about a trap that had 10,000 10, peach potato aphids in it, and that scares me to death. <laughs> You've got six. Yeah. Eric, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, there, there, in terms of tuber virus testing, um, in my opinion, it should be taken after a complete home death uh, and before harvest. There are different approaches to virus assessments. Samples of tubers can be tested direct using a, a molecular test uh, using PCR. The direct test uh, normally uh, can be done within two or three days. Alternatively, plants can be grown on from the tuber sample and the sap and leaves of each plant tested uh, using an antibody-based technique called ELISA. And the, this uh, growing on test normally takes uh, place about, you know, once dormancy break has occurred, and that's a big, a big, a big uh, uh, problem. We've got to break dormancy first then grow the plants on but that testing normally takes four, four to six weeks but there is in some recent testing that's been done by, by Ferra and by Naya there is a very good relationship between that grow on test taking four to six weeks and planting back and seeing what virus levels we have in the, the subsequent season. I think sometimes I think it will mention that there can be differences between uh, test methodology but you've got to ensure that the same uh, tubers are sent to each laboratory if you're doing a, a ring a ring test type type approach. Otherwise, what you're reflecting is variance in the actual sample and how the the sample is 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 taken. And just like that, um, it might well be worth just showing slide 43, Claire, if I can, if you can indulge me, please. I don't think I've got control anymore. <laughs> uh, Whoever's got control, if we can show slide 43, uh, your test results. So uh, your your result that you get out of the laboratory is only really as accurate as the the sample pattern that you undertake with within the field. I would implore that you it, the sample pattern that you engage in on the field really depends on whether you're expecting the distribution of virus to be to be random or it is aggregated with localized points of infection and that's really what we get as you can see here on the screen um i anticipated this question and you know what we do get is that the prevailing wind is normally from the west and we get aggregates of localized points of infection or spread of virus from primary infection, either from um, a rogue or from a, a, a seed tuber which was infected in the previous previous season. So if you've got that aggregated uh, distribution, you're much better taking a grid sampling basis of uh, sampling across the field, normally taking 100 tubers, and you, you would grid your field into 10 by 10 and take one representative tuber from a single plant in each of those uh, hundreds, hundred squares. Now, I know there's only eight by eight on there, but you know, bear with me. You know, make make it hundred, ten by ten to give you a hundred, uh, diagrammatic only. But in each of hundred squares, you take uh, a, a plant and remove a representative tuber, and therefore you're submitting to the laboratory what is a representative sample from from your field. It then comes down to interpretation of the the results. Brilliant. I, I'm going to move on to some PCN questions. Uh, they're directed at Eric, but I would like everyone else's opinions on some of these as well. Um, what is the best approach for PCN management going forward, and is it possible to eradicate PCN? So, Eric, the kind of the ag agronomist approach, but then uh, I'd quite like everybody else's opinion on that. Is it is it possible? Do you think within your businesses it's impossible to eradicate PCN? Okay, um, we need 
pieced in across the whole rotation and it needs to be considered as a priority particularly on seed uh, seed land and seed land blocks if you cannot measure it you cannot manage it so that is the uh, philosophy behind the high intensity sampling to detect at the very lowest level and by taking that sample immediately after your preceding potato crop you're giving yourself the best chance of detecting the lowest level of PCN and then you can invoke all the tools in the toolbox of which I've uh, given discussion on, on many of those this afternoon to reduce the population. Okay. It is possible. <laughs> I suppose, uh, uh, Will, did you have a, a, a thought on that in terms of how, where do you see, you know, what's your approach? Well, well basically, um, we took a strategic approach uh, five years ago as a business. And um, when I took over the tests across the, um, uh, all Godfrey's Northern Farms, and um, basically we could see ourselves coming into a, a, a uh, a bit of a problem if we didn't really approach it uh, aggressively straight away. Um, traditionally, we were growing potatoes in a one in six to a maximum one in seven, um, and PCN levels were just constantly, slowly but surely rising, and you can see through the samples. So we've taken it from that to now growing a sort of one in ten as a as a um, yeah, you know, a maximum, ideally a one in 15 we're going for now. And we've actually been able to take a lot more land elsewhere um, by renting in land and um, cutting, you know, uh, basically bringing in virgin land. We've been very fortunate being able to find that. And um, uh, so that's basically the approach we've taken. Um, also, one farm which had very high PCN levels basically said we're not going to grow on there for 20 years um and now we're in a very fortunate position to be able to do that by you know, by finding this um other areas and pockets of land so i know not everyone can't do that so that's been basically our approach mike do you have a, a strategy have you got um we do have a strategy we <coughs> we recently been faced with taking on a block of land where we have got some pretty high PCN levels. Um, I think Eric's absolutely right. It's a, a multi-pronged approach is, is what's required. Um, and yeah, I think varieties have certainly um, come on significantly in the last few years and, and offer a, a real ray of hope in terms of managing PCN, to be honest. And I think they'll form the cornerstone of our strategies, really. Um, one of the problems i think for a lot of potato growing businesses is perhaps control of land um, outside of the potato growing operation and having control of land around the whole rotation um, but also for us in this particular part of the world it's competition for land um, and returns to landlords and their expectations of um, how many times they want potatoes grown on the land so it's not always easy to bring all the tools to bear but um, yeah, it, it is important to have a, um, be armed with good, accurate information in terms of numbers, um, good, accurate, well carried out sampling is absolutely key, and good knowledge on speciation, and then you can form a strategy on the back of that. Um, but it, yeah, it's absolutely possible to, to eradicate it, no question about it. It's just a balance against the economic pressures yeah. to do that, really. Jim, do you have anything to add with what you're doing? We, you know, we are quite lucky in this corner of the country, but we have had a couple of issues uh, last year and this year, which one's involved in the in the, the spot farm. Uh, to identify where, it, where the PCN is actually located in the field so that we can do something about it. I suspect that the farm exports draw and imports uh, cattle nuts, so I imagine that's where because there's no history, there was never any history of PCN there. Uh, one thing that we do uh, is we, all, we always supply the you know, any rented land we have, we always give fluoxapur to the uh, farmer to put on in the, with the spring herbicide. And uh, if there's any uh, ground keepers there, then I'd normally go in myself and <laughs> 
because you know potatoes and any other crop are a weed. We need to we need to control them. So I'm going to go for a couple more questions, uh, and then we we'll, we will wrap things up. Um, going forward to help the control to control the spread of PCN, shouldn't we be educating all agriculture around hygiene to avoid spread in the rotation? So how important are the hygiene messages and what do you all think we can do as playing our part in making sure that that is, is dealt with or, or as best as possible? And I hope you don't just all look back at me. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I think it's very important that, um, you know, so we, we're obviously renting in a lot of land, but our, our landlords, I'll be honest, we have tried to educate them ourselves by making sure that groundkeepers aren't, aren't there. I mean, we've even offered to go and make sure they were sprayed off in the following uh, season, after the following wheat crop and things. So, um, yeah, we're, we're trying to do our part as long as, as, long as they're doing theirs. Um, and I'll be honest, I, I feel it's a very much an integrated approach, um, both grower ourselves, landlord. Um, but so uh, yeah, I, I feel yeah, as a grower, we we're the ones who actually have to um, so-called educate our our landlords and making sure we actually have a, a joined-up approach. Yeah, very much the same, really, and it's important as well. I think it's um, it's staff training, staff, um, you know, pre pre planting meetings, pre harvesting meetings, to make sure that everyone in our business is well aware of their the importance of hygiene and what's expected of them. Yeah, long term relationships with landlords is a big part of it as well. And as Will says, um, you know, where we can educate, or help, or be involved in volunteer control. In the rest of their rotation that's great and potentially that helps us as well where we're growing other crops that, and potatoes causes significant issues in volunteers um, so yeah it's a it's a rounded approach but it needs everybody engaged in it to have uh, to make it work i'll maybe keep going on with the questions because there's a couple of really good ones that okay. i get it is that okay? Um, there's one specifically for Eric. Do you think the compost for uh, compost for control of PCN? So I think that's the chitin that we're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. May also have an effect on powdery scab. Um, it has shown in some work to have a slight reduction on on powdery scab, uh, but that would not be the main justification for for. Uh, using it in the context of the, the the spot farm we will be looking at it once we get the data back from that field from last year then the plan is that we will be applying some chitinous compost to the, the known infected areas and monitor that over over several seasons to see a reduction the principle by which is working is that the shell coat of cysts of pcn cysts uh, are based on chitin and we're building up preferentially a, a microflora of uh, bacteria uh, in the, the soil that is breaking that down and therefore disrupt the, the viability of uh, PCN. So once they, you, you're creating a, a starter solution basically by putting on the compost, once they've run out, run out of the, the chitin within the compost, they'll then move on to uh, eating up the, the chitin, other chitin sources in the soil, such as the, the PCN uh, cyst shell. Brilliant. And, and then one back to uh, PCN and how strong is the case for retaining nematocytes or does their toxicity and environmental profile rule them out for future control practices? And I suppose we're coming against this in everything, aren't we? But nematocytes will be one that it is a worry. It, it depends who I'm speaking to on this one, but if we're being uh, completely honest, then nematicides, where they are uh, used appropriately, are safe just now, but there's no getting away from uh, there is an impact and an environmental hazard there. The granular nematicides uh, are more hazardous than the, the, the liquid nematicide, vellum prime in particular, uh, as a product has got uh, a far better environmental profile, but 
doesn't have the same efficacy in terms of controlling either potato cyst nematodes or free living nematodes in uh, a soil context. There's more activity uh, inherently within either Vidate or, or Nemethorin, but we, we know that getting uh, continued re-registration for these uh, granular nematicide products is an ongoing challenge, which the industry have got to face up with uh, at some point in the near future. We have lost um, nematicides in the recent uh, years, and there may well be a, a circumstance whereby we will either lose one or more nematicide, granular nematicides in the near future, or have the application rate um, constrained or reduced from the current rate, which will reduce efficacy. So we've got to think ahead, we've got to think outside the box as to alternative strategies. Brilliant, thank you. I think I'm going to uh, round this session to a close, but I would really like to thank all four of you for joining us. Um, it's a delight to work with you guys because um, you make everything real and uh, it's you know you, you bring the field back to us and make sure that we really understand those challenges and keep asking those questions and and as I said through the week we've had researchers we've had guys working like technical guys in innovation and also the markets and being able to work really closely with the strategic farmers um, allows us to understand the value of, of how we need to get that back to our levy payers so I thank you on my behalf and um, uh, also thank the audience for participating with some really brilliant questions and please keep joining us through this summer with uh, we are just learning new ways of getting information out there we do miss meeting you all in the fields and our events but um do keep speaking to us pick up the phone send emails um always happy to help uh, and 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 as i say we speak to the, these guys regularly and and learn lots from them but we're also ready to ask them lots of questions too so please keep in touch and um, thank you very much everybody for joining and um hopefully see you all soon thank you thank you